Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we're going to wait just a few minutes to allow everyone an opportunity to join from the waiting room, and then we'll get started with our talks for today. All right, once again, thank you for joining us um, for this session of the IMBUS Summer Conference Series for 2021. I apologize in advance, my voice is a little rough. I have a, a cold at the moment. Uh, my name is Matthew Shackley. I'm the secretary of the uh, IMBUS trainee board and I'll be moderating today's discussion. Today we have two speakers, uh, Elena Gregranko and Michael Skyda. Um, we would also like to remind you that Next Monday is our next talk in the 2021 Summer Conference Series with John Gabrielli that will also be on Zoom at 11 Eastern. And then next year, you can mark your calendars for July 21st to 23rd in Montreal, Canada. We'll be hosting the seventh biennial IMBUS Conference. At this time, I'm going to hand over to Elena Grigorenko. She's going to give a talk for about uh, 25 to 30 minutes. And then we will have a period of question and answer with her before we pass over to Michael Skyda. If you have any questions that you would like to get down in the chat while Elena is presenting, uh, I will moderate the discussion after the fact and uh, read those out to her. So Elena, it's all you. And, uh... And uh, okay, here's the share button, and here is the presentation. And uh, you, uh, okay, unmuted and showing the right slide, right? That okay. Well, thank you for that. It's always a trick. Um, okay. Well, um, uh, thank you very much for the invitation and uh, for this uh, wonderful award. It's a great honor. And because it is a very brief talk, um, unusually brief, uh, I would like to start with um, an acknowledgement slide, uh, which uh, the work um, which contains. Um, the people who actually do the work and the organizations that fund the work. Uh, the work um, that I'm going to be uh, sampling from today, um, uh, largely I've referred to as studies of language, but my abstract was a little um, uh, you know, broader than I could fit in uh, uh, 25 minutes. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to do today is focus on a particular study, but that study has been going on for about 20 years now. And uh, we just um, got some funding to continue this work. So uh, collectively as a team, as I mentioned, we study language among other things. Um, and um, uh, what I have chosen to focus on today is a study of uh, the genetic basis of developmental language disorders that um, has been unfolding in our group, divided between the two continents, and you'll understand 
why that division is important. Um, so what I'll do today is the following. I'll start with a brief overview of the hallmarks of the literature, which I sample to contextualize the study that I'll be talking about. And the study is referred to as the AZ study. That's our internal and external reference. Then I'll present the study, sample some of, of the publications on the study and tell you about our current insights with regard to our previous findings, uh, which, you know, these things, unfortunately, unfortunately, are not always go uh, and present themselves as consistently as, as you hope for. So um, uh, there is a number of uh, considerations that are relevant. So as, as you can see from the slide, linguists have a large collection of toys to uh, play with, of which the most popular are obviously European languages. And um, uh, these languages are the smallest and the least diverse group. So the AZ study examines developmental language disorders in Russian, uh, which is the state uh, language of the largest country in the world. The country, however, speaks over 100 languages. Some of them are critically, seriously, or simply endangered. Among all languages of the Russian Federation, the Russian language is the best studied, but Russian is one of the least studied European languages, right? So just to understand the continuum here, we're going to talk about one of the least studied languages of the most studied groups, but there are almost, um, you know, um, uh, uh, almost uh, 10,000 languages to consider and to generalize to. So uh, the multi-component view of spoken language uh, is something that clearly dominates uh, the current approaches to pretty much any language, any language related study. So the critical pieces that are typically singled out are phonology, morphology, semantics, syntax, and pragmatics. And they are really paralleled to um, you know, this evolutionary component of languages. Um, and what is important here that most of these components um, could be continuous among species. And they um, are shown here with gradient in the center with human beings the most advanced, right? So, but you can find um, analogous uh, or parallels to this multi-component representation in a variety of species uh, from goldfinch up. So with regard to this evolutionary view um, of language propagated in this particular citation by Jarvis uh, assumes um, uh, this this uh, view assumes that to support the spoken language, there should appear first some anatomical changes, subdividing the brain in the brain into subconstructs, uh, specializing vocal organs and differentiating neurons. And second, complex brain pathways for vocal learning and spoken language should arise. So these pathways engage different structures in different species culminating in humans and their complexity and multifunctionality, right? So first the anatomical changes, but then the pathways. And that's important for us to keep in mind because the evolutionary parallels show that these things are distributed in time and complexity. And therefore, those systems have developed in dynamics, right? So you cannot actually capture the whole system at one little um, um, uh, kind of um, representation, right? So there is uh, links and depths uh, to both of these aspects of um, the language manifestation. So um, the, uh, this multi-component view of spoken language has been of interest to us for many, many years. And uh, one of our earlier work in this uh, earlier publication, this um, uh, regard allowed us to sample uh, uh, postmortally from um, 
a variety of areas that are classically related to language function, uh, like Broca's, Wernicke's, and uh, the um, association uh, cortex. And uh, of no surprise is the fact that, first of all, there are many, many genes that were um, expressed in this regions collectively, 491 genes um, whose products we registered. And you could see that the overlap was only partial, right? So there is specificity. And again, um, uh, some general um, genes, generalist genes that are expressed in all um, three areas. Uh, the brain um, infrastructure is complex, not only in terms of the structures involved in their, dynam uh, in their dynamic connectivity, as um, shown here, uh, right? But it is also complex um, uh, in terms of um, capturing common activations for listening to sentences and sentence reading and an MRI study. Um, so, you know, basically you have to sample in different areas. You have to sample across time and you have to sample across um, um, different kind of uh, functional tasks to capture the system. And finally, there is a time dimension, right? So you have to uh, try to capture different windows in which different parts of the brain are involved so you can show the uh, continuity of language. With all of this uh, prefaces, again, we just have to keep um, uh, some general ideas in mind here is that we're not looking for a single structure. We're not looking for um, a single or a simple collection uh, of genes. We're not looking for a, um, a easily interpretable cascade of events, and we have to sample across periods of time. So um, the second set of um, inspirations um, relevant to the contextualization of the AZ study is uh, the huge field of research following genetic and linguistic variation. So um, I'm going to sample briefly two articles. Uh, so this article by um, Cavalli and his uh, colleagues um, uh, in this article by Atkinson, they're both about the great human expansion um, or out of Africa hypothesis. And um, this uh, um, um, expansion, as we all know, was accompanied by a continuous loss of um, genetic diversity, a result of what is called the serial founder effect. And this loss of genetic diversity was paralleled by the loss of linguistic diversity as well. Based on the interpretation of their funding, um, as all um, uh, more, you know, uh, as, uh, as all modern human populations maintain their ability to acquire and speak complex languages, it is clear that uh, the great expansion or before the great expansion, language must have been fully developed and the ancestral population. Um, although it's unknown when language became fully developed, the necessary organ must have uh, taken considerable time to reach the degree of complexity now common to us as a whole species. A really interesting question to ask, however, is a question is, um, why languages differ. So when they started differentiating, why and uh, what caused this differentiation? Uh, these differences appear to be parallel and perhaps even caused by the variation in the uh, populations that reflect specific linguistic variations genomes. Interestingly, they, di uh, they differ within Africa and outside Africa. So their diversification was not a condition of the great expansion. Functionally, languages did not have to differentiate, but they did. And uh, perhaps because these changes um, in genome 
four specific constraints they needed to be impl implemented in these languages. For example, uh, tonal inflections. And those um, you know, impositions, those changes in the genome um, might have uh, taken those languages away from the initial universal language or its components as defined as those multiple you know, componential elements of a language such as phonology, morphology, syntax, semantics, and pragmatics. Um, and in this context, in considering language variation, um, uh, it's, it's really important to, to think not only about population genetic effects that are really important, as you would see again from our example in particular, but certainly there are multiple examples of that in, in, in the literature, but also it's important to um, consider various environmental effects that are not independent, happening in parallel, and are related to um, the general um, change um, in, in this growing, expanding, or shrinking populations and uh, where they live. So the example that was featured in this uh, science uh, paper a couple of years ago refers to the development of labiodental sounds. Um, and the uh, labiodentals um, depend on bite configuration. So biomechanical modeling shows that bilabial sounds like F uh, of are easier to pronounce and um, uh, uh, they seem to um, accidentally arise under overbite and overjet than under the edge to edge bite that prevailed before the neo neonolithic, right? So overbite and overjet persisted only when exposed to softer diets that became characteristics with food production. And more recently with intensified food processing. So both developments led to spread of bio, uh, of, of uh, uh, the biodiversity that relate, uh, that led to the spread of labiodental sounds, okay? So as we changed uh, our, uh, tradition as a species from hunter uh, from hunting and gathering to producing food, we changed our bite and it uh, generated a window of opportunity for us to create new um, uh, sounds as a source of language differentiation. So. Um, just to summarize this introduction, typical and atypical language development is contextualized by specific populations, specific languages, and it's orchestrated by a complex brain infrastructure, the maturation of which is supported by multiple genes. And uh, this brain infrastructure is realized in different pathways, and its function is distributed in time. Uh, so it's perhaps uh, it is uh, why, uh, due to this complexity, our initial inspirations in finding the grammar gene uh, has, um, you know, have really disappeared more or less by now. So many of us, many of you probably know the um, uh, the uh, Fox P2 story. Um, it's, it's a gene that uh, was identified as a possible grammar gene in a single family that is uh, a famous family that is known as a key family. And uh, that um, story um, has been, um, you know, repeated multiple times in different contexts. And um, as a result, um, you know, we all celebrated uh, the importance of this gene, but it was early in the field. And now um, this gene, its relevance to language has been, has been um, questioned um, on a regular basis. 
So the gene is a large and very interesting, um, you know, uh, there were uh, some considerations of the selective sweep that could have differentiated modern humans, the, uh, the uh, purple line from everybody else. There are some very interesting sources of variation in this gene, and it's, um, it's attracted attention of many, many people until this paper appears by Elizabeth Atkinson and uh, her colleagues um, three years ago, questioning the relevance of the uh, selective sweep um, idea and um, uh, indicating that it might have been due, that interpretation might have been due just uh, to the fact that the sequencing data available then 20 years ago, almost 25 years ago, uh, just uh, weren't, um, weren't powerful enough, uh, were biased, and therefore uh, led to a wrong conclusion. So FOXP2 remains an interesting gene, of course. Um, you know, many people continue studying it, but we uh, should probably look for other sources of, and we are looking for other sources of relevant variation that is important in understanding the function and the um, malfunction of language. So that brings me to the AZ study, which is a study of um, a geographically isolated population, which, um, when we first approached it, um, included about 900 residents. Now it includes about 400 residents because of the leakage and differentiation. Um, and the prevalence of developmental language disorders um, in this population is strikingly high, over 30%. Uh, we, of course, paid attention to all possible um, uh, uh, agents here. Um, uh, the neural intelligence is typical. Uh, there are no significant sensory neurological or psychiatric problems that are uh, observed there. And they have multiple deficits in a variety of uh, linguistic and language domains that we have studied and published on. So why we're particularly interested in this um, population because of its uh, genetic homogeneity and environmental homogeneity. They have one kindergarten, they have one school, everybody lives pretty much in similar SAS conditions. So it should um, maximize our um, uh, success in finding the genes. Um, so what have we learned so far? Uh, first of all, as I said, um, you know, the, the a representation of both uh, healthy and non-healthy uh, linguistic uh, functioning or aspects of linguistic functioning is highly multidimensional and uh, very complex. For example, here, uh, when we analyzed a number of relevant genetic, um, uh, I'm sorry, linguistic domains, we uh, found that uh, numerous members of this population, which is largely one huge pedigree and then some small pedigrees around this huge pedigree. So um, most members of this population have some deficit. And roughly speaking, only about 30% of this population have no deficits that we've been able to measure or register. So we, of course, have done a lot of relevant genetic exploration, looking at a variety of uh, possible sources of um, these um, deficiencies. And um, in general, we considered both common variants and rare variants. Um, and I'm just going to highlight a couple of relevant observations. The first uh, observation pertains to this gene uh, set BP1, which uh, was uh, reported first in our uh, first publications as a potential source of um, uh, um, a source of uh, relevant variation. So it was highly associated with syntactic complexity. Uh, at that point, little was known about this function. 
but it was known that it's involved in DNA replication and he is protein involved in the regulation of synaptic toxicities. There was a syndrome associated with this um, uh, gene and um, it, it, there were also a couple of publications indicating that haploinsufficiency in this gene was associated with severe developmental language disorders. So we have studied this gene quite closely. Um, now there is a, a set BB1 society. It was quite interesting because pretty much, uh, you know, on the same, on the same day, uh, this paper was published. Uh, the first author, Sergei Kornilov, uh, received a phone call from a family uh, where there was a boy with a, a mutation in um, this gene. Um, and uh, really severe developmental language disorder presentation. So uh, this family has been really moving mountains around uh, this syndrome. Now there is a SETBP1 syndrome, which is fairly uh, well characterized. It's a very rare genetic condition. Uh, they pull together and worldwide association that is now called SETBP1 society. And the reason I'm talking to you about uh, this is um, that now there is a, a, a register of mutations in this gene that are spread around the world and uh, that are associated with um, uh, this um, syndrome. Um, interestingly, in our population, we have four of this, such mutations, right? So three uh, misstands and one synonymous, and we have no genetic syndrome. The gene is relevant, right? So, but we have no cases of SEDPP1 syndrome, uh, although the population carries this mutation. Um, so, but the gene itself, obviously, as we've uh, pointed out uh, in these two uh, publications, is important. Um, in the first publication by Megan Perdue, we showed that um, we showed that um, uh, uh, the, the, there is a significant association between variances at BP1 and phonological working memory. And in the second publication, uh, we um, investigated um, a lacked intracortical coherence using Iloreta in a mixed sample of children and cohesion of cortical networks seems to be also associated with the variation in this gene. Um, so that's the story, which is quite curious, right? So the gene matters in the population. We, um, uh, the population carries this severe mutation. We don't see any uh, explicit SATPP1 disorders in this population. This population carries other interesting features. Um, and um, in particular, uh, there is a gene that um, uh, captured our attention. This uh, is a PET100 uh, gene. This is a gene on chromosome 19. And this gene also has very relevant characteristics to brain function. Um, and um, there are, um, there are um, de deficiencies in these genes that are related to a whole other set of relevant presentations, including developmental delay and uh, in its um, homozygous uh, mutation status, um, even um, deaths in infancy or early childhood. Um, it's important uh, to make a reference that to that literature review that I alluded to before. So the population that we study has a fairly high coefficient of inbreeding indicating that there is a founder effect there. So the history of the population suggested that it's been settled um, around um, nine to 10 centuries ago and it's undergone through different expansions and contractions. Um, so uh, the history is interesting by itself, but it's looking like, you know, one or more founders in that group um, that founded that settlement uh, has had some language issues and they have been passed through generations 
But again, interestingly, some, some, some of them have probably been somehow calmed down because we don't see a severe explicit um, genomic syndrome-like presentation. So here we're comparing the breeding coefficient with um, us itself, a large cohort of uh, patients with ASD, which is a syndrome, um, and um, uh, control patients. So uh, finally, another little thing that I'm going to bring up, and I'm almost done, uh, pertains to copy number variation in this population. So it seems that their genomes are fairly dysregulated. There are so many little and large events that are happening in their genome. And these events are um, shown here. So as is shown in pink or red and two other populations, um, um, ASD in green and um, uh, typical um, control population is in blue. Uh, and you could see that um, some of the events, some of the copy number variants in, in, in our SD group are large, right, and frequent, uh, but our AS group has a variety of um, uh, uh, events and they're pretty frequent. They're uh, less frequent than in ASD, but they're more frequent than in the control population. Um, and uh, this is shown in a slightly different representation here. Again, large events and uh, less, they're less frequent than in ASD, but they're more frequent uh, than in the control population. So again, yeah, pointing to some disorganization in these genomes that exist collectively in this population. All right, so conclusions. Um, DLDs are complex etiologically and are unlikely to be driven by simple genetic mechanisms. Language is likely to be challenged in rare genomic syndromes. The degree of specificity of these challenges is to be determined. The AS study raises a number of relevant questions specifically concerning the role of the foundry effects in the local version of DLD, the role of copy number variation in DLD, and the role of diminished or compensated uh, function of uh, known harmful mutations that are harmful everywhere else, but not in this population. So as I said, I mean, this is our second attempt to re-enter this, um, uh, this population in this puzzle. We keep working on it. It's been a long lasting story and uh, we're obviously not in the end of that just yet, but it's been a lot of fun. And thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Dr. Grigorenko. Sorry. <clears throat> um, no worries, Matt. So in, in the chat, feel free to, to put any questions that you have for uh, Dr. Grigorenko. Uh, Jane Bernstein has asked, are the individuals with DLD communi communicatively competent? Can they exchange information with each other? And could this be the beginning of a new language form? What's the basis for calling it a disorder? Well, they're completely uh, functional. It's a functional population with, um, you know, 12 years of schooling. Um, there, there are no colleges in these settlements, but people go out and get their degrees and come back and work as teachers and nurses and so forth. Uh, if you visit, um, you can understand them. They can understand you. So, uh, but if you start... Uh, measuring, right? Assessing and measuring, you see what I've shown you, right? And it meets uh, what we see, the deficits uh, meet the DSM-5 uh, categorization of developmental language disorders, right? So there is a group of them, you can diagnose a variety of uh, specific disorders under this big umbrella. Um, and, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's a syndromic presentation, just like autism spectrum disorders. Uh, but uh, it is a disorder. It's not a new form of existence, again. And we've compared uh, this um, individuals with a, a typically developing uh, population, um, if you wish, two villages down, right? So we controlled for rural effects, we controlled for SAS, 
um, and uh, we see still those uh, features that are core features, classic features of DLD as defined by DSM. Thank you. Uh, Michael Skyda asks, what's known about effect sizes of SET pv one variants, WRT uh, brain data and test scores? Right, so ZBV1 um, uh, variants, if they are among those that are documented by the society, uh, among those that I showed on one of my slides, they are large effect variants, right? They cause the syndrome. Um, and the syndrome is complex. It has not only language-based presentations, it has presentations that are related to cardiovascular system and uh, um, other issues. Uh, and again, not all kids have all presentations, right? So most of these events are de novo. Um, uh, but it's unclear what, because of the severity of the mutations, right? And phenotypic presentation, but it's unclear at this point how much familiarity we will eventually see as we document these cases. Um, initially, it was, uh, it was uh, seen as an expressive language disorder. Um, it was believed that the receptive aspect was stronger, uh, but uh, as the sample size grew, um, Angela Morgan published a paper out of Australia with the largest uh, sample size just this year, showing that it's really just a language um, challenge. It, it, it is not biased towards either um, expressive or receptive. We're very puzzled by what we see uh, among um, um, azonites uh, because we see some of these mutations. We do not see large effect sizes. Besides, this gene, as I alluded to, is not a causal gene, a you know, single causal gene of this deficiency in this population. It probably contributes to the orchestra, but it's definitely, um, it doesn't explain um, the story here. So needed, needed more players. Thank you. Uh, we have about another seven or eight minutes with Dr. Grigorenko. If anyone would like to add anything else in the chat that they'd like to ask, we'll give a minute or so here to see if there's any more questions. Yeah, maybe I could speak up directly, Matt, if you don't mind. Absolutely, go ahead. Uh, thanks a lot for the for the talk, Elena. Um, so, in in this population, um, you try to control uh, for environmental variation, right? To to get more closely to like the specific genetic effects. Nevertheless, I'm I'm wondering, um, given you know that genetic variation most likely does not explain all of the variants in language behavior we see, what would be possible sources of uh, gene environment interaction? So um, would this be like some interplay with early language experiences or would these genes interact with environmental factors already in utero? Is there like anything known about gene environmental genetic environmental interplay? Uh, well, it's obviously a fair question. Um, well, let's try to peel it, peel it off a little bit like an onion, right? So, um, so it's, it's, again, it's, it's, the group is small and uh, pretty much every single kid um, goes to, you know, a preschool of some kind um, uh, very, very few kids are kept at home. Uh, it's just not, you know, it's not common, right? So everybody works. Uh, women are not, um, um, you know, um, housewives. Uh, so, uh, and they go through the same teachers, through the same buildings uh, as they grow up, right? So it's a pretty um, minimized um, kind of, uh, schooling experience uh, variation, right? 
So they obviously come in uh, with a different um, uh, with a different genetic uh, luggage, if you wish, which of course gets intensified uh, by the fact that a lot of their parents are affected themselves. And that means that they don't speak much, right? So they just don't generate a lot of products. I mean, and, it, and of course, I mean, it's a rural school, but it's a Russian educational system, which is pretty strong, right? So uh, you see a lot of people, first of all, pretty much everybody graduates from, um, uh, from, from you know, at least nine years of school, and then they uh, either continue or select an alternative path for a profession. Um, but within that um, kind of uh, variation, you again, you see that the inbreeding is not trivial, right? It's not your trivial value. So you probably uh, know that people with language deficiencies marry people with language deficiencies more frequently, although we don't have this data on the population scale in, in this population. And as a result, they probably generate so the, those enclaves of silence or more silence than usual. And those babies are probably not exposed to as much verbal production uh, from their parents um, as they would otherwise. But of course, there is TV, there is radio, there is kindergarten and all of that. So it gets eliminate, uh, 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 it gets kind of softened a little bit, right? Um, so if you think about general environmental exposures, uh, we have thought about that, but we are not seeing anything. Uh, they're pretty isolated. Um, they're surrounded by the woods. Uh, we are not aware of any intoxication of um, you know, the soil by anything or the waters by anything. We've never done an environmental study, but there is no evidence that we should. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I'm, we have considered multiple, very, multiple possibilities. We haven't really resolved um, a single one. Thank you again, Dr. Grigorenko. I think this is a kind of a natural transition point to uh, Dr. Skeet, uh, Skydas talk. I'm just checking the chat one more time. Well, again, thank you for invitation and uh, thank you for the honor. Thank you once again. And uh, at this point, we'll transition again to Dr. Michael Skyda um, and Again, if there's any questions for Dr. Skyda during his talk, feel free to put them in the chat and we can revisit them uh, at the end. You're muted. Okay. Let me just uh, unmute myself, okay. Great, so um, before I start, I would like uh, to thank uh, the organizers and the society for the uh, great opportunity to present my work. So I'm really looking forward to this talk today. So today I will walk you through our uh, research program, which is uh, centered on the developmental origins of intelligent behavior. And in the first part of this talk, I would like to introduce the overarching objectives of our work. So here I wanna clarify, uh, what do we actually wanna find out? One of our key questions is uh, what the universal principles are that underlie the emergence of intelligent behavior. And we find that most existing answers are either generic. So think of classical 20th century theories like constructivism, behaviorism, and so on. So, which means that these frameworks do not capture how kids master a particular lear learning challenge. Now, all these classical frameworks are uh, largely descriptive. So what do I mean by that? So 
Um, let's take learning to read as an example. Children first uh, randomly link uh, scribbles or single characters uh, to spoken words uh, when, uh, when they, uh, then they, you know, decode single letters and then they move on until ultimately uh, they master uh, whole word recognition. Now, uh, traditional uh, Piaget style models assign these behavioral manifestations to a certain underlying cognitive stage. Yeah, so for example, uh, if you have a look at the scribble reading again, so this would, would indicate that a child uh, entered the symbolic stage of learning to read, yeah? while whole word reading then indicates entering the orthographic stage uh, and so on. So uh, the question is, um, does this explain uh, what generates uh, these behavioral changes? And uh, my answer would be uh, no. These black boxes are actually, or these cognitive stages are actually uh, like, like black boxes that we have to open. So I think that an explanatory theory of learning has to account for the fact that behavioral change is implemented into self-organizing and also self-reorganizing biological systems. So the developing brain in particular, uh, but also genes and environments. Um, an explanatory theory also needs an algorithmic backbone. And uh, the algorithms ultimately should be able to learn things in a computationally explicit way. Uh, think of deep learning, for example. Uh, deep learning is super powerful for some practical uh, learning challenges, yeah, like learning to recognize handwritten letters um, and so on. Uh, but the actual computations of deep neural nets often cannot be made explicit. Yeah, so at the end, this is another black box like Piaget's cognitive stages. Uh, although uh, this might change soon, right? Uh, so um, deep neural nets, artificial intelligence, that's a rapidly advancing field and we might be further in a couple of years. Um, what I would also like to do on this slide is to narrow down our research focus here. So um, in the universe of intelligent behavior, uh, one major topic for us is symbolic understanding. Uh, this is what I think really makes us human since we use uh, much more powerful tools uh, for exchanging representations of the world compared to any other biological species or machine. Uh, another important feature of intelligence is uh, to not just passively respond to incoming stimuli like uh, simpler biological systems do, but um, to actively generate behavior based on mental models of experience. Now, just to take a simple example, so very early, um, during development, we learn to count items by ordering them along an abstract mental number line. And this is quite a sophisticated mental model. The theory of learning also has to account for the fact that human children are equipped with these mental models from very early stages of development on. For example, they intuitively adapt their behavior to the laws of physics. And they intuitively understand that human behavior uh, is guided by thoughts and emotions, you know, intuitive psychology. Now, uh, even newborns have an intuitive mathematical understanding. They can dis discriminate, uh, for example, between small sets of numbers. And I will also argue later in this talk that infants have intuitive reading abilities that are grounded in object recognition. Uh, interestingly, uh, these foundational skills have been found to be among the strongest predictors of learning outcomes in both reading uh, and math. There are two additional major research avenues that we walk in the lab and that will, I will walk together with you today. Uh, one additional question is, why do children differ so strongly with respect to their learning trajectories and their learning outcomes? 
Uh, in other words, why is learning so easy for some and so hard for others? Think of learning difficulties like dyslexia and dyscalculia. The other question is based on the fact that learning challenges differ tremendously for children across the globe. By that, I don't mean uh, obvious social cultural differences, but rather cognitive cultural differences that are fundamentally related to how we perceive and think about the world. And a theory of learning must be able to explain these cultural cognitive differences to be universally valid. Uh, that's why we are putting major efforts into overcoming traditional biases towards Western samples. Uh, you will hear more about our field site work later on uh, with a focus on Hebrew and Hindi Devanagari writing systems and uh, finger counting routines in children in East Africa. Before I talk about our studies, I would like to briefly introduce our methodological approach. Uh, we conduct neuroimaging experiments in early childhood samples, mostly magnetic resonance imaging, but also uh, recently MEG. And we have to keep in mind that neuroimaging data are noisy. Yeah, so let's assume uh, this box plot that you see here depicts the distribution of a bold signal time series. Uh, what you wanna get, get rid of in your study is uh, this error variance here. Traditional neuroimaging tries to achieve this by sampling from about like 20 subjects or so. Uh, with moderate success, uh, as the replication crisis have, has shown, so what's the way out of this? Uh, I think there are two uh, main solutions. The first is to go for population neuroimaging, yeah, like we do as members of the uh, Enigma Origins uh, Consortium. So here we have an N of 7,000 data sets. Yeah, with such an N, we can effectively uh, reduce error variance by sampling from a really large population. Uh, there is another solution, so, though. So the other solution, I think, is to focus on uh, within subject replication uh, instead of between subject re replication. This is what we do, for example, in our ERC project. Here we have developed designs that allow us to collect many data points uh, in a very short amount of time um, to reduce error variance. And uh, this also gives us the chance to examine children individually, which is also crucial um, for this talk, I think, because this is crucial for educational uh, application, right? So because in educational practice, what matters most uh, is the individual case, I think, not some abstract group average brain. A substantial limitation of the field that I currently see, and that I would also like to briefly mention here, is that most of the data we have is correlational. So strictly speaking, such data uh, cannot reveal uh, the developmental origins of intelligent behavior. Uh, they could simply re reveal uh, yeah, its correlates. And we try to overcome this by conducting controlled intervention studies. Uh, in most of our ongoing studies, children take part in reading or math-related training programs. And on this slide, you see a classical design, which is based on four data points featuring an immediate and a long-term follow-up, uh, which is uh, suited to capture learning trajectories uh, not only in a linear fashion, but also, which is very important, in a non-linear fashion. Because most of uh, what we see at the individual level in terms of trajectories uh, is rather non-linear. 
Earlier in this talk, I have argued that children do not learn to read from scratch. Uh, instead, uh, they are geared up for this task since they have intuitive reading abilities. And some of these abilities are grounded in object recognition. Uh, we know that the fusiform cortex of four to six month old infants already responds selectively to visual objects that belong to a certain semantic category. So responses to faces, for example, uh, can be dissociated from responses to other objects at this very young age already based on EG recordings. Now, what does this have to do with reading? Uh, well, letters can be seen simply as an abstract category of visual objects, yeah? just like faces or fruits or houses. And we assume that when children learn to read, the brain simply reuses these pre-existing resources because it's the most economical solution. So uh, children already have a vision to meaning interface emerging as early as in the first months of life. What happens when we learn to read words is that a new interface is implemented that allows us to assign meaning not only to natural objects, but also to abstract symbols. So before a child is able to read, uh, this interface area would show no or at, at least little response to words since they are still meaningless for the child. But with further practice, this area would become more and more sensitive to the meaning that is conveyed by words. And the response pattern should become more and more similar to the pre-existing object recognition pattern. And this is a simple hypothesis that will be tested by our uh, PhD student, Alex, and our ESC project. And Alex will also compare algorithms that could possibly do this kind of learning, uh, especially uh, deep learning and uh, Bayesian inference, uh, including probabilistic induction. Why is this important? Well, because learning to read is a remarkable achievement, isn't it? So this text is full of spelling mistakes induced by scrambling letter positions, but you still instantly understand the meaning of what is written here because you learn to recognize whole words, not just single letters, right? And this efficiency is vital in our digital world. Yeah, just think of all emails that will land in your inbox this week. Yeah, you have to process this information very quickly. Uh, by the way, we would also argue, um, given that we will talk about cultural univers universality later on, uh, we would also argue that this kind of holistic world, world recognition is a truly universal cognitive capacity. So no matter whether you learn like the German alphabet or Hindi alpha syllabic characters or Chinese logograms. At the beginning of the talk, I mentioned that newborns already have some very basic intuitive mathematical understanding. Now, for example, uh, they can distinguish a display showing four dots from a display showing three dots. Uh, but this is initially, at the first months of life, really just a visual detection mechanism. And uh, this Visual numerosity detection mechanism can be found in many non-human species, uh, for example, non-human primates. And we know already that there are number selective neurons in the anterior intraparietal sulcus and the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex of the macaque. These neurons uh, fire most strongly in response to one preferred number and gradually weaker to neighboring numbers, resulting in Gaussian tuning curves. What we want to find out now is how the developing brain enables children to develop an abstract understanding of number. And by abstract understanding, we mean number processing that is uh, independent of low-level sensory features like visual size, shape, position, and so on. 
and that operates not only in the visual modality, but also in the auditory modality. Finally, we want to track the emergence of a symbolic number understanding. So arbitrary associations between numbers, digits, and number words. Uh, we can test this now because neuronal tuning to number can also be detected at the population level with fMRI uh, using population receptive field modeling. Uh, we hypothesize that children develop abstract numerotopic maps in the course uh, of an early math intervention that we will conduct. And in these uh, numerotopic maps, voxels that are closer together um, have the same preferred number irrespective of the input format. And if you have a look at the animation at the top right, um, what you might have noticed already that is that initially these maps are probably unspecific. Then the patch size increases before shrinking again when the responses become more specific. Um, and if you have a look at the animation at the bottom right, you see uh, you will see that number tuning functions are probably first flat and then grow sharper and become more specific in the course of the number training. Uh, this would also be a nice starting point for exploring network level learning algorithms built into frontoparietal and hippocampal circuits. Uh, number selective neurons can be learned um, by an unsupervised deep neural network. This has been shown recently in a science advances paper. Uh, the problem though is um, that the how is unclear. So how does this network uh, you know, solve this problem. So if there's anyone among you, uh, you know, who knows this paper or this work and could, can ex explain to us what this deep neural network actually computes, please get in touch. We would be very curious to learn more about that. Now we move on to the research we did on individual, individual differences in learning. Um, actually, the work I've just shown uh, certainly also has implications for individual differences, but uh, in this section, I would like to focus on dyslexia and dyscalculia. Here we looked at genes that had already been found to be related to dyslexia and dyscalculia in our previous behavioral studies. And uh, it is clear that there's no such thing as the one and only single gene for dyslexia or dyscalculia. So the picture is far more complex. And I think this also resonates uh, with what uh, Elena has uh, shown us in her talk. Uh, but nevertheless, I would like to guide your attention to NRSN1 and uh, Robo1. The functional role of these genes has been investigated in rodent models of early brain development. We'll first have a look at NRSN1. So NRSN1 ensures that neurites branch out and form cortical microcircuits. Uh, if NRSN1 is downregulated, nerve cells uh, simply form less neurites. Yeah, this is what you can see uh, in the two GIF animations uh, in the top left. Now we will have a look at Robo1 below. So Robo1 tells nerve cell populations where to settle down in the cortex. And if Robo1 is downregulated, these nerve cell populations miss their target layers. So carrying certain variants of these genes may have an effect on early cortical dif differentiation. And this variation may lead to subtle differences in volume that we can pick up with a structural MRI. We found a significant association between NRSN1 and the volume of the left fusiform cortex. This is interesting because we have seen before that the fusiform provides crucial resources for learning to read and plays a key role for whole word recognition. We also found an association between Robo1 and the volume of the right inferior parietal cortex, which houses 
those number neurons that I have talked about before. Uh, importantly, these were five to six year old kindergartners uh, without formal instruction experience. So uh, it's relatively unlikely uh, that these results are a consequence of learning differences. Yeah? But these data might rather point to, uh, to an early predisposition. At the functional level, there is some evidence that these systems generate specific responses uh, to written words and numbers, uh, which may be less precise than the courtesies of individuals uh, who develop dyslexia or dyscalculia. Yeah? So these um, stimuli might be encoded in a less precise um, fashion. Yeah? But this is uh, currently just a working hypothesis that needs to be confirmed in uh, future studies. Uh, that being said, uh, these early brain volume data were significantly related to learning outcomes at school, uh, even when removing the effect of general cognitive ability. And uh, my former PhD students, Indra and Ulrike, have shown in a number of studies that brain data explain up to 20% of unique variants on top of the best classical behavioral predictors. So going beyond behavioral assessment uh, offers great potential uh, to better understand and explain learning. The neurogenetic work we did is small scale and uh, of course awaits replication in larger independent samples. And also there's a lot to learn about the impact on envir of environmental forces on learning and their interplay with other biological systems. Uh, there are many candidates here, including the so-called home learning environment, um, but most of these uh, data are also confounded with genetics and have relatively small effect sizes. And we will tackle some of these issues as a member of the Enigma Origins Consortium. Um, this is an initiative that is spearheaded by my colleague Becky Nickmeyer at Michigan State University. Um, it's a multi-site collaboration of 19 labs worldwide. And we are um, currently gathering together uh, the largest data set in the field with an N of almost 7,000 data sets. So in the final part of my presentation, I would like to give you a, a quick, quickly a, a general idea of our cultural diversity work. So what you see here is an established psycholinguistic model of reading. Uh, which works very well, for example, for the English alphabet. Yeah. But now what about Hebrew, for example, yeah, where letters are assembled, assembled around so-called roots. Yeah. So what are roots? Uh, roots are typically um, two to three characters that always ex appear in a fixed order in a Hebrew word. Yeah, these uh, form the backbone. These are the, the backbones of words in Hebrew. Um, so a universal model of learning to read needs a specific uh, letter array detector to be able to learn Hebrew. Yeah. Uh, and here's another example. So traditionally, uh, the model was confined to the phoneme as the smallest linguistic uh, unit. And only recently, it has been extended to the syllable level. And this is an important advance now because we can now test whether the model can also explain learning to read uh, in writing systems in which the smallest linguistic unit is not the phoneme, but the syllable, yeah, like Hindi Devanagari. And finally, there's also a lot of work ahead to make this model biologically plausible. Yeah? Right now, uh, it uses uh, a model that is, uh, was made for design for classical conditioning. And it's clear that children do not learn to read uh, like Pavlov's dogs do. Um, finally, and this is my last slide before I wrap up, um, let's get back quickly to the number maps I've mentioned before. So from a cross-cultural view, the question arising here is whether these number maps are culturally universal. Um, as we have seen, uh, these maps are organized like visual receptive fields, uh, but vision is not the only modality that shapes these representations. Um, they might also be shaped by motor representations. Uh, this makes sense behaviorally because it's well documented that finger counting is a milestone in children's math development. And this is where cultural differences come into play. 
Yeah, for example, our European finger counting routines uh, routine is really different from the routine used by the Maasai in Kenya. Yeah, for example, they do not stretch out all fingers to denote five. Yeah. And it might be that the representation of five in this population is pushed back by neighboring number neurons, yeah, resulting in a completely different numerotopic method. And this culture-specific competition for neuronal resources uh, is a plausible scenario, I think, especially for motor areas of the brain. But we think that other number neuron populations, for example, in the frontal parietal systems, are not modulated by these routines, but show a culturally universal abstract response. And this is the key question to be addressed in our field site study um, in East Africa. Okay, so my time is almost over. I'll um, wrap, wrap up. What can you take home from this presentation? So I have outlined my uh, future vision of developmental science as a theory-driven discipline that not just describes developmental uh, stages, but is also able uh, to explain the ontogeny of intelligent behavior. And I have praised intervention studies as the methodological gold standard uh, to increase the causal relevance of our data. I've also argued that children do not learn to read from scratch, but are equipped with powerful object recognition and number detection machinery that they can reuse for higher order learning challenges. And I've introduced candidate genes for learning difficulties that might play a role for early cortical development. And I uh, confess that little is known currently about how they interact with learning environments. And finally, we have seen that learning challenges for the brain differ substantially across cultures. Okay, that's, uh, that's it. I would like to thank all students who did the great work uh, in these projects, uh, the institution that, institutions that have recognized this work and the institutions that have, that have made this work financially possible. And I invite you uh, to also have a look at our website, but um, right now I'm very happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, we have a question from Renata oh, quite a while ago at the beginning of your talk asking, uh, did the models, intuitive physics, maths, reading, and psychology depend directly on environmental input? Now that's a uh, that's an uh, interesting question, but I think uh, the answer uh, clearly is yes. So, I mean, um, if they wouldn't depend on environmental input, um, the emergence of these systems would be like something that is purely, purely genetically driven. And this is something that we uh, rarely see when we talk about higher cognitive functions. And in fact, I would even argue that these models would not even develop um, without um, proper stimulation, right? So if you think about reading um, um, and object recognition, um, I mean, this heavily depends on parent-child interactions in the first months of life, yeah? Um, so uh, the answer is definitely yes. Um, environmental input um, definitely uh, substantially contributes um, to the emergence and then also to the refinement of these early intuitive models. Renee, Renee's written a long one for me to read. Okay. Uh, Renee says, I 100% agree, Michael, about individual studies. One issue is getting these studies published or in other ways disseminated. What role can IMBIS play in getting these smaller uh, sample studies disseminated? We really need to think about current models of publishing, data sharing, and collaborative studies. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, so I think what we can do as a society is make people aware of the fact that um, the decisive criterion for replicability of scientific work is not necessarily just simply a large N, uh, but in the end, it's um, the reliability, reliability of the statistical indices that we generate. Yeah? And if we can generate um, single subject effects 
um, with the that have a large effect size and can be uh, reproduced independently, um, then I think we could make a strong case for these individual level studies. Yeah, um, I think it just needs some some rethinking because classically I think we are really tuned towards uh, between subject replication in huge samples, but this can also be at the single subject level, and I would be happy. Um, to advocate this kind of work. John Higgins asks, could intervention studies show how teaching curates the data that a Bayesian learner uses to help the learner select, uh, reach the correct inference faster than learning from randomly generated data? That's a cool question. Sounds already like a potential project. Uh, yeah, I find this really interesting. And I don't see, uh, and like, I mean, it's, uh, I see this for the first time, but I really like this idea. And I think this is, would be very well suited for a uh, um, Bayesian framework. Yeah, because um, Bayesian frameworks nicely built on this idea of um, integrating prior knowledge and making predictions about new input. And it would be very interesting um, to bring this into a um, into a teaching framework. I think that's a cool idea. I would have to think about it, but uh, I think yes, it sounds really interesting, really great. Andy Smart asks, um, "How distinct do you think phoneme-based and uh, alpha syllabic systems are in terms of auditory and visual skills?" You seem to suggest they're contrasts rather than being on a kind of spectrum in terms of language orthography. Yeah, thank you for that question. Yeah, that's heavily debated right now. Um, so I have to admit that I'm more on the side of the people uh, of the fraction thinking that it's a continuum. So, so I would say that there's a continuum between um, phonemic representations and syllabic representations. Um, but there, is, there are also opponents, um, especially many scholars um, who, work or, who work on languages that have alpha syllabic or even logographic levels of representation. So mostly colleagues from India and China. And they, uh, you know, they have some data and they always argue that syllable processing is completely different. And the argument goes into the direction that syllables in contrast to phonemes put higher demands on working memory and this have, have to be processed by um, a completely different neural system that places heavier demands on prefrontal cortex resources. Yeah, I would argue, uh, no, I would, I would say that both of these are processed in a continuum that is represented um, in the along the superior temporal lobe. Uh, right now, I don't have good data to, to support this, but I will have uh, hopefully in a couple of months when the first uh, data points come in from our field site study in India. So I think right now it's a pretty open question. James Booth asks, um, is calling it intuitive reading the best term given you argue for the importance of input? What exactly is intuitive? Is the ventral occipital temporal cortex involved in linking abstract visual symbols to language? Yeah, thank you for this question. The first part of this question is really difficult. It's getting really philosophical, I would say. Um, the last question, is the ventral occipital involved in linking abstract symbols to language? Um, uh, the answer to this question is definitely yes. So um, I think there's um, substantial evidence for that. For example, work from, from uh, Gregory Hickok's uh, lab. Um, so the answer is yes. Um, what exactly is intuitive? Yeah, so um, this would definitely have to be defined. So intuitive uh, means um, that mm, these models, for example, if you think about numerosity detection, are pretty co-Rs. So this means they can only take 
they have very limited capacity. Yeah? For example, they only work on, a, on very small sets of dots. And then they undergo substantial refinement over development. Yeah? Um, and um, in terms of reading, this would mean uh, that children initially would not factor in subtle visual features in linking, linking a visual object to meaning. Yeah? So this is what is meant by intuitive. And uh, I think if I put it this way, like if I link it to this operational definition, um, this would still make sense from a developmental perspective, because then I would say that in the home learning environment, when children interact with their parents and engage in gradually more complex um, you know, objects uh, and, and contexts, this would undergo refinement. Yeah? So this would be aligned with the idea of uh, um, intuitive models. And um, yeah, I think this is the operational definition that I would, I would use right now. I don't know um, whether you are happy with that. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, we have a few more minutes. If anyone has any more questions for Dr. S Dr. Skyda. So we'll just take a moment. So, so if not, if you still need some time to also think about this at the talk, please feel free to also write me an email. So I'm always happy about uh, emails coming in after the talk. Uh, I'm happy to think more about your questions and happy to answer it. Uh, and of course, yeah, you can also pre feel free to read up a bit on that uh, on, on our website, for example, where all, all our, our papers can be found and then maybe, you know, new questions emerge that I'm happy to answer later. Fantastic, we're not getting anything else. Thank you so much, Dr. Skyda. Um, I'm gonna put up a slide real quick to remind everybody <clears throat> that, um, our next talk in the series is on Monday, this coming Monday, July 12th at 11 Eastern time. I should say 11 a.m. Eastern time uh, with John Gabrielli. And um, be on the lookout for our seventh biennial conference next year, July 21st, 23rd in Montreal, Canada. Um, thank you all so much for attending. We look forward to seeing you on Monday. Have a fantastic rest of your week. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Actually, returning to the uh, previous question. And thank you, Matt, for doing such a great job introducing uh, us and leading, leading us through this discussion. I can recommend this for me. I can definitely.